and I'm delighted to introduce Nancy Piercy. Nancy Randolph Piercy is the Francis A. Schaefer Scholar at the World Journalism Institute, where she teaches a worldview course based on the study guide of her book, Total Truth, Liberating Christianity from its Cultural Captivity. In 2005, Total Truth won the ECPA Gold Medallion Award in the Christianity and Society category, in addition to an award of merit in the Christianity Today Book Awards. A former agnostic, Piercy studied violin in Heidelberg, Germany in the early 1970s, and then traveled to Switzerland to study Christian worldview under Francis Schaeffer. After graduating from Iowa State University with a distributed studies degree in philosophy, German, and music, she earned a master's degree in biblical studies from Covenant Theological Seminary in St. Louis, and then pursued further graduate work in the History of Philosophy at the Institute for Christian Studies in Toronto. Currently, Percy is a senior fellow at the Discovery Institute, where the focus of her work is on the cultural and philosophical implications of the evolution controversy. She resides in Northern Virginia, where she and her husband, Rick, who's in the back, takes taking pictures, <laughs> where she and Rick are homeschooling the second of their two sons. We are thrilled to have Nancy Percy with us today. And the format for the session is on this little card that hopefully you received when you came in the door. What we're going to do is um, ask Nancy questions, and I get to start with the first question. I also invite you to write down questions if you have them, and send them down to the center aisle, and they will be brought forward to me. And I will read these, go through these, and pick some out to read to Nancy. And then what we'll do at the end is have an open Q&A. That will be followed by a reception out on the balcony and a book signing. And in addition to um, being able to purchase books out there, we also have five copies of Total Truth that we will be giving away as a drawing, in a drawing. So if you didn't write your name down on a little slip of paper, um, raise your hand and we'll make sure you get one of those before the drawing. So I would like to ask Nancy to come forward and I'm going to ask her the first question. And Nancy, what I'd like to ask you is if you could give us your testimony and tell us why did you write the book Total Truth? Nothing like starting off with a very mo small question. <laughs> I told Sarah I kind of enjoyed this format because I do so many, um, so often I speak at university settings where it's all very academic and very serious. And she said, just come in, let's talk, let's talk about some more personal things about how you wrote the, wrote the book and why and so on. And I thought that sounded like fun. Um, the first question, my testimony. Um, I grew up in a, in a Christian home, in a Lutheran home, um, Scandinavian Lutheran. If any of you know, <laughs> have that kind of a background, you know that it can be very somewhat dry and formal. And when I began, uh, be became a teenager, I started asking questions about my faith, as many teenagers do. Um, but I, I didn't really get very many good answers. In fact, I didn't get any answers. <laughs> Um, typical was a pastor who kind of patted me on the head and said, don't worry, we all have doubts sometimes. As if this was some kind of stage, you know, <laughs> with some psychological needs, but that, you know, you outgrow it. And that wasn't the, that wasn't the case. I mean, we've, our c culture is secularized enough these days that, you know, young people are, are being encountered, they're encountering non-Christian worldviews, and they are wondering, how do I know that this is true? And that's what I was asking. How do I know Christianity is true? This was so far from the mindset of, my, of, of at least my parents and pastors, and I think still today is still the case, but especially ethnic groups, right? You're, you're Swedish. What, what else can you be if not Lutheran? You know? <laughs> you know, there's just no conception that you leave the faith. But in my mind, is if I couldn't find good reasons for believing it, I thought it was a matter of intellectual honesty to reject my faith and to try to look at it objectively alongside the other religions, philosophies, belief systems of the world and see if I could make an actual decision which one I thought was really true. It was a rather ambitious project for a 16-year-old. <laughs> But I literally began going down the hallway to the library in the public high school that I attended and pulling books off the philosophy shelf. 
Because I thought, where do people even ask this question? Where do people ask, how do I know what's true? You know, <laughs> what's the purpose of life? How do I know if there is a moral system that's, that's you know, objective and real, or, or if everything's just our own perspective? Uh, you know, adults don't go around talking to kids like that. <laughs> and I didn't even know where to start. And eventually, though, I, 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 I decided if I was going to be honest about this, I had to go all the way. You know, if there's no God, I, want, I don't want the emotional, warm fuzzies of religion. I want to face, I want to be Bertrand Russell. <laughs> you know, I, I want to face this honestly, that there is, if there's no God, there is no basis for ethics. Uh, it was obvious to me that if all I have is my puny little brain in my s slot in time and history, it was ridiculous to think I could have any kind of absolute transcendent truth, any universal truth. Relativism was obvious. You know, the, obviously, that we could, know, we could not have um, objective moral systems, object, objective truth of any sort. In fact, I pretty much sank right, back, right into postmodernism <laughs> very rapidly. And it was in that state um, that I was, over, I was overseas going to school in Germany and ended up um, encountering Labrie, Francis Schaeffer's ministry there in uh, Switzerland. Um, and the questions of, I, I could not even, I could not even in, um, consider the question of whether Christianity was true when I didn't believe in truth, you know, that there could be any kind of truth. You know, that's where Sh Francis Schaeffer's pre-evangelism proved so important. I couldn't listen to the claims of Christianity unless I first believed that there was such a thing as truth. And that's where our argument started. <laughs> in fact, um, they were pretty severe arguments. I left after a month. <laughs> I fled <laughs> because it was the first time I had met Christians could, who could even talk that kind of language, who understood the questions of, of uh, truth. Determinism, I, I had my, my science classes. I was a determinist, relativist, you know, s skeptic in terms of knowledge. Um, so those were the kind of arguments we had. Actually, I, I went back to Libri later, but the first time I was there, I, I literally left after only one month. Um, I went back home and began reading, but through, through uh, Labrie, I encountered Schaefer, C.S. Lewis, Chesterton. I discovered there was such a thing as Christian apologetics and began reading pretty much on my own. And after, um, after doing a lot of my own reading, eventually I decided I was convinced enough that this was true, um, that I then needed to make the step of faith. You know, once I'd become convinced intellectually that you could make a good case for Christianity, that it did have better answers to explain you know, the universe, the existence, uh, who we are as human beings, it explained it better than any other worldview. Uh, then the final step was to, you know, to bow the knee before the Lord and accept him as my Lord and Savior. It was, um, uh, then I, it was later, I, I said, okay, where do I find other Christians? <laughs> well, there were some at Labrie. <laughs> so I decided to go back. That's the only place I really knew where, other, where Christians were, since that's, um, that's where I'd encountered them. So I went back and, and, and stayed four months and got more grounded in the faith that way. And so this is the reason why I'm so passionate about Christian worldview. As I saw how crucial it was in my own conversion that this, uh, the pre-evangelism, pre you know, questions of tr truth, questions of um, how do we, is there such a thing as an objective morality? You know, are we just machines programmed by evolution? These kind of questions were mine, and it certainly has not gotten any easier for young people today. They are all the more surrounded by non-Christian worldviews, um, and they need to have the apologetics. They need to have reasons for faith. They need to know why it's true and how they can argue for why it's true. Um, it's, it's no longer optional. You know, in my parents' generation, it was easy to, to think, you know, the, the only difference between me and my non-Christian neighbor is I go to church, but we all accepted the same basic morality. And it was easy to just say, uh, go to church and then just be respectable. Um, you, it's no longer possible. You, you will not survive a Christian faith if it's compartmentalized that way. Today, young people have to know what they believe, why they believe, and how to defend it. They must be much more intentional about their faith than, than we were when we were young. Um, and so that's why, I, uh, that's why I wrote the book, to answer your question. <laughs> um, the other yes, I have lots more questions. And please, if you do have questions, pass them down. Oops, sorry.
Oh, there it goes. Okay, you mentioned science a, a few minutes ago, and I have a question here from Hector in Leadership Studies, and he says, what should be the relationship between theology to science, and who should ultimately define reality? <laughs> God. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> Certainly, science is where that, that assumption is most challenged, that um, as Christians, if, if, we, if Christianity is true, if God is real, if God exists, then everything has to be understood in relationship to God, including our science. And what we have in the modern world is, is of course, um, the different academic disciplines have claimed to be autonomous, you know, autonomous from any notion of religion, autonomous from any moral constraints, um, uh, with a new foundation based on naturalism. Nature is all that exists. And so the challenge to, uh, I think the challenge in science has, is not so much in the scientific details, so those are important, of course, but the main challenge is over the question of what is the foundation is it, you know, does God exist or is it naturalism? Is nature, all, is nature capable of doing all the creating? If, if nature can do all the creating, then uh, God may exist, but that's all he does. You know, he's out of a job. He's not gainfully employed. <laughs> you know, there's nothing for a creator to do if nature can do all the creating. And, what does, and what's the impact of that? Well, then God's existence is not necessary to explain the world in any way. It's not part of, it, it doesn't have any cognitive function. Well, then... As a result, religion has only an emotional function, and re religion becomes redefined as something something that we can tolerate for people who need that kind of a crutch. Right? If, if it doesn't have an explanatory function, it becomes just an emotional thing for people who can't who who can't take their science straight. <laughs> there was a recent um, there was a recent uh, Scientific American editorial um, responding to. Have you seen Francis Collins' new book, The Head of the National Human Genome Project is a, is a Christian, a theistic evolutionist. And uh, so because of his stature, a lot of uh, scientific magazines have had to acknowledge his book. And what this uh, Scientific American editorial said is, well, well, we all know that when it comes to the facts of the case, evolution has completely disproved any form of creation myth. But we have to understand that for some people, you know, they, they look at the realities that science reveals and they, they see the wonder of creation and they like to, what did he say? Um, they, they, want to, they struggle to have a deeper sense of, of meaning and design in their life. Well, I have friends who, who emailed this around and said, look at this great article. It's finally acknowledging the role of religion. And I, <laughs> and I wrote back and said, whoa, whoa, whoa. Wait a minute. What they do? What this is is the good cop, bad cop strategy. You know, the bad cop strategy says, in terms of what we of real knowledge, you know, in terms of the facts of the case, we know that science has utterly disproved Christianity. But then the good cop comes in and says, but for those of you who really need this, um, is you know, it's politically convenient for us. It, it, it's 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 better for us politically to acknowledge that some people out there. Uh, need to have kind of an emotional overlay over their f over their science, and we just have to be patient with these kind of folks. So it's a, that's the good cop, bad cop strategy. And, and when when scientists are feeling um, confident in their cultural power, you hear the bad cop. Yes, we hear the Dawkins, Richard Dawkins, and the Daniel Dennett's of the world who come out and say Christianity has no place in the modern academy. Uh, it's been utterly disproved by Darwinism. And then when the uh, religious right sh shows its political muscle <laughs> and they realize that uh, you know, the natives are restless <laughs> and uh, the natives are realizing that they have a voice in politics over uh, funding issues, <laughs> then, they, then they bring out the good cop. But if you listen carefully, what the good cop usually says is, you can have your religion as long as you don't make it any a matter of true knowledge, as long as it's just your emotional experience. In fact, um, the, I, an example I just read, and so it's in my mind, we're talking to Galen about this. Um, a, there was a recent uh, conference uh, with, in, in uh, the UK, and a British philosopher, Cambridge University philosopher, uh, was telling the reporter afterwards that he was, he's a Jewish background. He said, I love to go to synagogue. I, have, I love to pray. I have a great relationship with God. But the funny thing is, I don't believe in God. I'm an atheist. And the reporter said, how can you do that? That doesn't make sense. 
And he said, well, religion is sort of like reading a novel. You know, you can get caught up in it, you can get a sense of meaningful participation, and it can be a very enjoyable experience, even though you know it's not true. And I thought, that captures what, uh, that captures a modern view of, of religion. This is a question from a School of Government student, Stephen. Often when I speak with other Christians, they seem to have either a postmodern or aesthetic worldview. When I discuss... Uh, atheist. Sorry, I couldn't read your writing. <laughs> um, when I discuss with them the Christian worldview, it seems over their heads. What is the best way to approach the situation? Over their heads? Yeah, so and scientists all agree with each other, right? There's no controversy in science. <laughs> That's a different question. Are you shifting on me? <laughs> Let me just deal with the postmodernism first. See, I think this is an interesting question because I, I get this question a lot, especially with educators and, and youth pastors who say, are young people all being caught up in postmodernism? You know, we need to change the way we teach. We need to change our church programs. We need to change everything to address the postmodern mind. Um, and the answer to that is not so fast. <laughs> the answer is that Modernism is still firmly entrenched in many parts of culture, and certainly in the hard sciences, certainly in, in much of academia, certainly in business and industry. You don't design a jet with postmodern principles, politics, and so on. There are many areas, many of our power centers of, of society are still very modernist. Postmodernism tends to be in English. Uh, the arts, pop culture, and so on. And so the, the question is, you know, as Christians, we need to be, have an answer for both. Sometimes people will be more one or the other. I mean, all my scientist friends are very modernist. <laughs> I spoke at um, UC Davis recently, and I mentioned that Richard Rorty, Richard Rorty, a well-known postmodernist, right? And I, I t talked about how Darwin, Rorty himself says Darwinism leads to postmodernism. Because if, Darwin, if natural causes produce the mind, the human mind, then what we believe is not because it's true in any transcendent sense, but only because it, uh, uh, it works for us. You know, the, the mind, our ideas, our ideas arise by chance, just like Darwin's chance variations in nature, and the ones that become firm convictions are the ones that work in helping us cope with our environment. And so... He says, this is what pro then this is what postmodernism is. You know, it's not what's true or false. It's, it's ideas or tools for getting us what we want. So I gave this whole talk on how Darwinism leads to postmodernism. And this, this one um, graduate student stood up, and he has a, a, um, a news website uh, where he attacks ID people. And he stood up. So he's very, he's very much an, uh, an anti-ID activist. And he stood up and he said, I, I don't know about this Rorty guy. I'm kind of an enlightenment guy myself. <laughs> and I thought, see, when you talk to these guys, you need to be very modernist. You know, when you talk to, you need to be aware when you're talking to scientists and others, some people are very modernist, engineers. Then if you, but if you go to, Ho then I spoke at Hollywood. <laughs> I spoke to um, Hollywood producers, screenwriters, and actors. And I'm like, goodness, they were completely postmodern. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to totally shift, you know, the way I address them. So in one sense, uh, this is why evangelism is an art, not a science. You do adapt to the questions and the mindset of the person you're talking to. And today we need to know both. And actually, most people, are, most people have some of both. Most people have a split mindset. When it comes to science, there we're talking about truth. Everyone has to accept scientific theories, no matter what your private beliefs may be. But then when they shift over to religion and morality... They're, they're completely postmodern. You know, their religion is, is just a matter of your emotional experience, your feelings, what works for you. So really, with most people, what we're talking about is a split view of truth. And, and you, those of you who read Sha Francis Schaeffer, you remember he was, he was one of the first to alert Christians to the fact that this is what we're up against now. Remember he used the image of two stories in a building. You've got your down, up lower story and your upper story. 
um, that's what we're up against with most people, is they'll sh jump back and forth depending on what subject we're talking about. And so then we need to step back and say, where did this come from? There's this wonderful book on this, by the way, those of you who are educators. If, if you haven't read it, I recommend it. It's by um, Julie Rubin, a Harvard historian, called The Making of the Modern University, and it's how facts got separated from values. She says that up until about the 1930s, American universities all operated on the assumption of what, she, of what was called the unity of truth. That was a phrase that was used, the unity of truth. The assumption was that if the universe is, a, is one, is a single unified system, obviously the truth about it will be a unified system. And we have to find a way to make sure our science and our religion you know, ultimately correlates. And you know, re science supports religion by showing the rational design of the universe. Um, religion gives us morality, reason supports faith, and so on. And so everything is a single unified system. And that was the conviction, is that we need to find a way to bring it all together. The shattering of the unity of truth is what marks the modern age. And the main turning point was the rise of Darwinian evolution. Because if, if, Dar if, if natural processes can do all the creating, like I said earlier, then religion is just an emotional crutch for those who need it. And she said that's, about, so it really hit about the 1930s. Uh, our universities became fragmented, and now the fact value split, as it's called, is just endemic in the American mind. And uh, Schaefer warned us about it in the 70s. It's much more so today. Dallas Willard, who's a philosopher at USC, he's, he's written on this too. He says, this is the main thing we're up against. It's so much part of the American mind, people don't know they have it. You know, people don't realize they have a fact value split. And so the first step we need to do is simply make people aware of it and, and become aware of it maybe in ourselves. Learn how to dis dis uh, discern it in our teaching materials. Learn how to get our students to be aware of it. And then um, to come back around to your question, if I was talking to a non, uh, postmodernist, I'd help them to realize you've defined, fa you've defined truth only in what Schaefer called the upper story. Well, postmodernism is just the realm of values. That's a very narrow, very truncated view of truth. I, mean, I don't want to, I, I want the whole truth. Then after I talk to the science person, I do the same thing. Uh, you, know, you think truth is just in the lower story? How limiting. You don't live that way yourself. You don't live that way yourself. Uh, the, the prime example here um, is Steven Pinker. You know, he, he had that best-selling book, How the Mind Works. And it's fascinating because he, he says in that book, uh, he's, okay, he's a scientist, he's trying to be totally lower story in the realm of facts, and he says, we're just machines. You know, if we're created by blind me mechanistic forces, then we cannot be anything but machines. And even the brain is just a complex data processing machine. But then he acknowledges that there's a problem with morality. Because if we're machines, morality doesn't make sense. <laughs> Holding people morally accountable only makes sense if they can make free, undetermined choices. And so he says, now we all want people to be moral, so we need to find a basis for morality, and yet there is no basis in my worldview. And he faces that head on in his book, and he says basically, he says, you end up, he says, you treat people as complex data processing machines when you're working in the lab. And then when you go home at the end of the day, we go, this is a quote, we go back to speaking about each other as free and dignified human beings, depending on the purposes of the discussion. So you see what he's done? He's got the upper lower story. And when he's working uh, in his professional persona, <laughs> he works from the lower story but he realizes that doesn't work in real life. You, know, you, can't, you can't go home at night and treat your wife like a complex data processing machine. No, no. You better not. <laughs> and so in real life, he finds he has to jump up into what Shaver called the upper story and suddenly start treating people as, as though they had dignity even though his own philosophy gives him no basis for it. See, it, so it, it, in that sense, it is a postmodern thing. He, his understanding of human rights, human dignity, human freedom is all in the upper story, but has no ra rational basis. And so what you say to people like that is you show them that neither one can live with their own worldview, that only Christianity gives a big enough worldview to account for all of human experience. It's the only one that's big enough. Uh, the, the, the mental image I use sometimes is, uh, if you think of a worldview as like a mental map, right, that, that, that you use to, to navigate the world. Well, the naturalist, 
or the postmodernist, either way, has, has their map is too small. It doesn't cover their own, their own ex even the full range of their own experience. It covers only one part of it. And so they, in real life, when they go home to their family and friends, they have to walk off their map <laughs> in the area that their own world view doesn't account for. Um, and so that's, wh and that's where we get them. <laughs> in apologetics, then, you know, that's where you would point out, you see, see, you can't live within the confines of your own world view. When you're talking to a non-Christian, you can't just say this is what the Bible says because it's th that's an authority they don't accept. But what you can do is show that they cannot live with their own worldview. Their own worldview is too small. They have to, that, and that Christianity is the only worldview that is big, gives a big enough map <laughs> to cover all of human experience. Nancy, the next question is related to the upper lower story of uh, Francis's um, theory. And could you respond to people, this is from Gary, a communication and government student. How do you respond to people who say that Francis Schaeffer is naive and simplistic? Oh, well, he wasn't a academic philosopher. Um, and he didn't claim to be. Um, and <laughs> I think there was a bit of professional jealousy that happened. Um, I mean, he's, People are not saying he's simplistic anymore so much. That was an initial reaction. When, Sha when Schaefer, when you know, hundreds of young people were flocking to Labrie, me being one of them, and coming out and saying, I never heard this before, and coming back and saying to their, especially those who are returning to Christian colleges and saying, how come I'm not getting this in my Christian college? How come I'm not getting this kind of worldview and apologetics? Well, it put their teachers and their pastors on the spot. I mean, even my parents, when I wrote Total Truth, my mother said, we didn't know you were asking those questions. And I reminded her all the times that I did. <laughs> we did. I said, how do you know your faith? Is, and how do you know this is true? But they didn't take it seriously. And my, my parents didn't. Like I said, they were, the, the ethnic thing was part of it. But I think they put the teachers and parents on the spot and the pastors and so on. And for a while, there was a bit of a reaction against Schaefer partly because of that. And they looked at him and they said, he's not a professional philosopher. No, he's got, he's got cartoon history. <laughs> but he was always just an, eva he was an evangelist. He was taking the insights of the professional philosophers. And his, his unique gift was to take it out of the ivory tower, take it out of the textbooks and show people how to use it. What I just said a minute ago about showing people that their own worldview is too small, that's just, that was Schaefer's method. He, he was able to take... Uh, the textbook version, and you know, look with, you know, and work with a young person who was hitchhiking across Europe and 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 stoned out of his mind on drugs, and say, you know, uh, let me show you, let me show you how Christianity answers the questions that you're dealing with, because even the young people um, who don't seem very academically oriented are picking up these worldview ideas from their environment. You know, it is shaping their minds. And uh, what I found most fascinating as a, uh, when I first arrived at Labrie was they even knew the questions better than I did. <laughs> they were able to phrase what I believed better than I could because they, I, I was picking up these ideas in a sort of inchoate, you know, way, just absorbing them from my environment. But no one had told me, okay, here's what you're believing, here's where it's coming from. Oh, that's where it's coming from? I just knew I had these ideas. So Schaefer was very good in terms of hands-on, practical apologetics and evangelism. That was his gift. And even Total Truth, you know, provides a lot of sort of the background uh, philosophy and history that he didn't do, but that was, that he, he was, you know, that was implied in all that he was doing. And Schaefer's reputation is coming back now. That, that initial reaction, I think, was temporary. People are becoming, becoming now to realize, now that, now that people are becoming more and more aware of the importance of worldview thinking, they're going back to Schaefer and saying, whoa, he had a lot more than we realized. Thank you. Um, you mentioned youngsters a minute ago, and I have a few questions here about um, teenagers and youngsters. This first one is teenagers, oh, this is from Rennie, a psychology and counseling student. Teenagers growing up seem to be avoiding the Judeo-Christian worldview. How much does denial of God have to do with a preset decision not to have to admit to an almighty God? A preset decision? Why would they have a preset decision? I'm not, I'm, I'm not quite getting where the question's coming from. Okay, Rennie, or where are you? <laughs> Wondering if you kind of 
And it, and it might be a kind of thing where we talk about uh, people needing to be evangelized over and over again until they finally come into acceptance, and that may be the process of this denial being broken. Well, I, I mean, in one sense, it's, it's always the case, isn't it? I mean, we're sin fallen sinful human beings, and we flee from God. You know, we run and hide like Adam and Eve did. In one sense, I think that's a spiritual truth that's always it's just intrinsic in being sinful. Um, I mean, almost almost everybody comes into the kingdom with some resistance, right? <laughs> if you've converted at a later age. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. See, but but what what we're encountering today, though, in addition to the natural tendency of the sinner, you know, to want to flee God, what we're encountering in addition to that, of course, is that many of us are being raised in a culture that says there is no God and that science has disproved God, and has that you know we think the whole weight of the intellectual world is against it, and uh, you know that's that's where the pre-evangelism comes in. We have to clear the ground. You know, we have to clear, pre-evangelism is just clearing away the barriers so the person can hear the gospel. <laughs> I mean, once you get to the gospel, it's the same for everybody. But some people you have to clear away a lot more than for others, depending on what the background is. Certainly today, I, I don't think we can get away with um, sort of dismissing people's ideas as, by saying, you have a moral problem. You know, that was, that's, you still encounter that in a lot of Christian circles. Well, if you've got an intellectual question, we know what's really behind it. <laughs> you really want to be out partying, right? <laughs> um, and Christianity gets in the way. I don't think we can get away with that because really anyone who's also got antenna out on our culture today is picking up the messages that, um, that science has disproved God. In fact, this um, Richard Dawkins, have you, uh, you know, the arch Darwinian, has come out with, uh, is coming out with now with this new phrase, the new atheism. The new atheism is new because in this, in this sense, the old atheism was willing to let, re let religious people, you know, live and let live. Let's respect religion for its, its um, it work among the poor and the hungry and so on. Let's respect it. Um, let's not uh, c come against it he you know, head first. The new atheism is evangelistic atheism. <laughs> you know, it's out there saying religion is not okay. It is not socially useful. False, but socially useful. Mm -mm. It's not socially useful. It is harmful. It is socially harmful. Um, and Sam Harris, The End of Faith, best-selling book, that's new atheism. These are people who are saying, we're out to actually say religion is socially harmful. Francis Crick, who was a co-discoverer of the DNA, um, double helix structure of DNA, um, says religion is something that should be done among consenting adults. It should not be taught to children. Dawkins has said uh, raising children in the church is a form of child abuse. Um, so the, the new atheism is much more hostile and of course, part of it is 9-11. Part of it is saying, look at what Islam is doing. And, and if Islam is doing this, it's time, to f it's time to go after the more moderate forms of religion as well, because it's the moderate forms of religion that allow the radical forms to exist. This is Sam Harris's argument. So you, know, you can't grow up in this environment without having some intellectual questions about how do I, you know, how do I know God is real? And I think it's, it, as a result, it's all the more important that we give honest answers to honest questions. That was Schaefer's phrase, honest answers to honest questions, not simply dismiss them as uh, you've got a spiritual problem, you have a moral problem. Um, I, here's an example uh, from my own life. I, I had just become a Christian. I came back uh, to college, and I was with a, a uh, campus group, camp Christian campus group, and I was still struggling with non-Christian ways of thinking. Right? So, um, I mean, these things don't go away overnight. And so I went to a sociology, in my sociology class, the, the, the cultural relativism is so endemic. This was a, the greatest challenge to my faith was in the sociolo sociology class. It, it was such an unspoken assumption. And of course, I had been such a relativist before that I was you know, being pulled back into that mindset. So I went to the leader of this campus group and I said, I really need some help. You know, give me some, some intellectual ammo I can use against relativism. And he said, Nancy, sister, <laughs> 
I sense that you're having problems with assurance of salvation. <laughs> I said, no, I'm not. <laughs> you know, on the spiritual level, you know, I had recently become a Christian, but I knew that if you acknowledge your sins and you ask Jesus and, you know, to be your substitutionary atonement, you've done the transaction, you're in, you know. Uh, so I knew I'd done what I needed to do if God existed. I was having doubts and second questions over if God really even existed, you know, because of the pull of those old ways of thinking. Okay, that's an example. You know, we need to learn how to answer the questions about relativism and not just try to shift them to the, you know, the familiar ground of spirituality. That he could deal with, theology. Yeah, yeah, he could deal with that. So he just tried to pull me over there. <laughs> we need to deal with the questions that students are coming with. And they, that when they come out of their sociology classes wondering, you know, how can I defend even the notion of truth, let alone Christianity being true? We need to give them those, the, the equipment they need to fight those battles. Nancy, this is a question from Mark in Communication in the Arts. You're homeschooling your own children. What is the best way to effectively prepare children to be Christian apologists without descending into monastic education? Yeah, I think that they should... The, the, the principle is they should hear it from me first. <laughs> Anything they're going to encounter out in the world, they should hear it from me first. They should hear about all the isms. You know, there, there are... It's kind of two basic principles of Christian education um, vying with one another. There's protection and there's preparation. Right? Are we pulling them out of the secular world just to protect them, or are we pulling them out so we can better prepare them? And for a long time, it was protection. I mean, I went to Lutheran schools through sixth grade, and it was all protection. <laughs> first, and, f and, and the, the result of that is when I first started hearing secular ideas, it had the added attraction of being something your mother never told you. you, know? <laughs> you know, it was cool. It was sophisticated. <laughs> um, and, th and at least we can get rid of that. If they've heard it from you first, it's like, oh, that's old hat. I know that. I've heard that before. At least get rid of that, that extra attraction. But more than that, of course, is giving them the tools to deal with it. Giving them, you know, they should hear about humanism and evolutionism and uh, radical feminism and um, naturalism and materialism and uh, Marxism and any other isms. And they should be hearing it from you first. Um, teachers, Sunday school, te Sunday school, you know, youth workers and so on. Along with the tools to handle it. Age appropriate, of course. You know, you don't dump it all on them when they're five. <laughs> I also think, though, it's another way to appreciate your faith better. You know, it, 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 the, the principle is if you give answers before they're asking questions, it comes across as preachy. You know, people say, how do I give, you know, how do I teach children without them tuning me out because I sound preachy? If you give the qu answers before they have the questions, then you'll come across as preachy. So you want to inspire questions. So expose them to evolution. Expose them to what Marx said. Expose them to what, um, you know, the local atheist said. Pull, pull, pull um, articles out of the newspaper. And let them ask, you know, what, 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 would you do, what would you say to this, you know? And then when you give the answer, they'll appreciate it much more. Compare, uh, teachers have always known, compare and contrast is one of the best ways to learn, right? So you, give, you show them, for what, what I said earlier, how all these other worldviews have only a truncated view of truth. They have maybe part of the truth. You know, naturalism is part of the truth, but, it, it, but, but they themselves, naturalists themselves, can't live with it. And, by, and when you see by comparison that Christianity has answers that all of these other worldviews don't have, then you get excited. <laughs> ah, you see it for yourself. That Christianity has answers that none of these other worldviews have. And then it's not monastic because your child is not, you know, you're not protecting them from these ideas. You're training them for spiritual battle. I'll ask one more question and then we'll open it up for, for everybody to ask questions. And this is from Jeremy, a law student. Where do you see American Christianity heading? Are we 50 to 100 years behind Europe or do you think we're heading in a different direction? Oh, different direction. Um, definitely a different direction. Um, one of the things that I discovered when I was doing the research for Total Truth 
was how different American Christianity is from European, classic European Protestantism. I hadn't realized that. I was, I was raised Lutheran. Or my grandparents came from the old country. <laughs> And so I did not realize I had a much more European form of Christianity until, uh, until after I became a Christian and uh, came back to the States and started discovering that these you know, American evangelicals thought differently from the way I did. <laughs> what was this? You know, so that, that was a source, that was a personal question that was behind the whole third section of Total Truth where I d talk about the history of American evangelicalism. And historians today say that um, American evangelicalism um, is a very distinct form of Christianity. It's, it's not uh, it's distinct from you know, pro classic Reformation Protestantism in the sense that, um, uh, to summarize, in the first and second Great Awakenings, especially the second, um, we fa well, we faced a much different cultural environment. What did we face? We faced the frontier. I mean, Europe was highly cultured, highly educated. People here came out and were building log cabins um, on the frontier and losing culture. Sociologists put it this way in a nutshell. People were moving west faster than the social institutions could keep up with them. So they often had no schools, no local government, um, no law enforcement. And of course, often no families even. A lot of single men would go west, especially during the gold rush. Um, and a lot of people in trouble with the law. <laughs> you had trouble with the law or trouble with your neighbors, you'd pack up and go west. <laughs> and so that's why the, the frontier was so, it's, it was such a lawless place. So when you, when you think about much of American history, remember th for nearly 300 years we were a frontier. The frontier shaped American culture to a large degree. So when you think of the frontier, think Dodge City. Yeah. The question to Christians at the time was, how do you bring religion to Dodge City? Very different from what they faced in Europe. How do you bring, bring religion to, uh, to rough, dangerous people who often don't have much education? Well, the answer is you do what the revivals did in the First and Second Great Awakening. Yeah, you grab them by the throat <laughs> with an intense emotional conversion experience that persuades them that the supernatural is real. And then you tell them to you know, stop drinking, stop shooting each other, and live straight. <laughs> you know, so not a lot of high church ceremony, not a lot of you know, elegant theological language, not a lot of deep doctrine. You know, get rid of those you know, stodgy but serious Reformation hymns. And a lot of the revivalists wrote their own hymns so, uh, so that they were sort of folk songy, tap your foot kind of uh, songs, not hymns, really. <laughs> and so... In many ways, that's the, that set the tone for American evangelicalism. Emotional, um, tended to focus on the conversion experience to the, w without a lot of training and not catechizing. You know that term? You know, not bringing people up in the faith, and learn your catechism, memorize Bible verses, you know, memorize the creeds, you know, know your con the confessions, the Heidelberg Confession, the Augsburg Confession, all this, this sort of uh, you know, intellectual e explanation of the faith that surrounded the older Protestant faith. That was all cast aside. Instead, it was what's, what works right now to get a conversion and get these people changed. Very pragmatic, um, very individualistic, you know, you, you didn't address you as part of a church. You were addressed as an individual. Um, so the individualism, the emotionalism, the pragmatism, you know, all of this is unique to, to American evangelicals. And, of course, the anti-intellectualism, which is the main thing I deal with in Total Truth. This is the heritage of American Christianity. It's, and it's, you know, it's got a good side and a bad side. You know, the good side is that it focuses very heavily on personal commitment. Europeans often don't understand this. <laughs> you know, intense personal reality. That's the good side. The bad side is, what is, is that it tended not to have any Christian worldview. You know, the anti-intellectualism, the um, uh, pragmatism, w pulling, pulling uh, advertising methods from the commercial world. That had never been done before. That was totally new. Now, now, can you imagine any Christian ministry that doesn't <laughs> use the latest ad advertising techniques to raise money? Um, so where are we heading? Um, it's hard to say because I see two trends. On the one hand, I see this, this, what I just talked about becoming even more exaggerated, like the secret churches. 
you know, less doctrine, more emotion, more individualistic, whatever works for you, more pragmatic. Those trends are actually being accentuated in the, t in the secret churches. On the other hand, I do also see, as I travel around, a lot of people are saying, I, 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 that's not enough. You know, we can't engage a, a very sophisticated, a very well-educated uh, culture without more intellectual tools. We need Christian worldview. So I'm, uh, you know, I'm encouraged to see the number of people who are turning towards Christian worldview and wanting to have better tools of relating their faith to their work, to the professional work, to the, you know, to the political involvement, and so on. So I see those two strains, and I'm not quite sure <laughs> uh, where they're going to head ultimately. Thank you. Well, there were a few questions I didn't get to, but I wanted to open it up now and see if anyone else has a question. If you do, please raise your hand and we will bring you the microphone. In the, um, the historical overview that Schaefer gave, as well as uh, in your book, one of the things that I, I, I seen was missing was the impact of um, dispensational theology and its tendency to produce dualistic dichotomies. Uh, I was wondering wh why that was not addressed, especially with its predominance within evangelical churches. Yeah. You know, it, it's very big in some circles, but the historians that I read didn't deal with it all that much. They didn't feel that it had that strong of an impact on evangelicalism as a whole. I suppose it depends on where your own roots are and what you're dealing with. Um, I do agree that dispensational theology has had a tendency to make uh, people feel that why bother having an impact on this world? Um, you know, wh why 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 polish the brass on a sinking ship? You know that attitude. Um, so I, I guess that's the answer. It, it is yes. It's something that probably I, sh I should deal with more because I encounter more and more people who say this. Uh, this is my background. I need I need to have a response to it. It's just that the historians I read didn't deal with it that much. They didn't seem to think it was that important. Actually, it's just displaced uh, the covenantalists. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. I'll um. I'll look into it. <laughs> Mrs. Piercy, um, I have read your book, and one of the things I noticed was uh, chapter 8, you talk about pragmatism is a homegrown f homegrown belief in America and how pragmatists such as, um, well, Darwin's new theory and also, like, um, Holmes is being pragmatist and um, Dewey, it just part of the pragmatistic movement. My concern is... And then your comments you mentioned about during the first Great Awakening, there was a lot of very pragmatic. Wouldn't that be, you know, conforming to the pattern of the world? Wouldn't that be conforming to the pragmatistic culture? Um, getting into pragmatism, getting into Christianity, is that a bad thing? Well, you put your finger on an interesting point. There was one historian who said pragmatism came from the evangelicals. You know. <laughs> We, we tend to, you know, when we look at the philosophical pragmatists, Dewey, Holmes, William James, Charles Peirce, um, you know, they were all non-Christians. And uh, we tend to think of it as, as a secular philosophy, but you are absolutely right. The pragmatist mindset, uh, and one, one historian, I don't remember who it was now, um, but one of the ones I, I read while I was doing my research said exactly that. So pragmatism came from the evangelicals. That's where they got it from. And so is that a bad thing? <laughs> yes and no. Um, it depends on, uh, obviously, if it's true, it will work. But the fact that it works doesn't make it true. And that's the difference. If it's true, it should work. There is a pragmatic component to truth. Um, and it's, it's, if I keep going back to the example I gave earlier, if your worldview is too small, it won't work, right? It won't work in the real world. I think uh, C.S. Lewis had a, a, a quote to that effect. He said, the Christian and the materialist have a very different view of the world. One of them is not going to work because it doesn't fit the shape of the universe as it really is. So if you go out and try to live that way, it's not going to fit. Um, and so there is a component where we, uh, of apologetics where you say, if you can take it out, if your worldview functions, you should be able to live by it. If it, if it is true, you know, think of a mental map. If you have a map, 
you know, if your map, if you're following the map and you keep falling off cliffs, you know, <laughs> running into walls, there's something wrong with your map. So in one sense, yes, there's a pragmatic component. But prag pragmatism, of course, goes much further. It says there is no objective truth. The only thing we have is you know, adapting to our environment. It's an evolutionary view of truth. So that's an important distinction. <laughs> Philip Johnson once said, you know, Philip Johnson, the, sort of the leader of the ID movement, once said, the problem with pragmatism is it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> who wants to trust yourself to somebody who, th who says the only truth is, you know, getting them whatever they want? <laughs> anyway, that's, that's so think of it that way. Pra pra problem with pragmatism is it doesn't work. Would you comment on Frankie Schaefer's uh, <laughs> really rejection of his father's Reformed uh, theology and his um, a relatively recent conversion to uh, orthodoxy and some of his more strident works? Um, how to answer that? <laughs> the only thing I know personally is um, that Frankie Schaefer had a lot of problems. <laughs> Frankie Schaefer had a lot of emotional problems, and um, he had sort of the you know sort of the typical PK, you know, pastor kid, mish kid kind of problems where your dad's this big, well known. Um, Representative of Christianity, and therefore, and therefore, <laughs> um, you rebel against it. Um, and I, you know, it's it's so personal. It's probably not something. I, I think his. I think the source of it had more to do with psycholo the same psychological things we see in missionary kids and pastors' kids. I think my my take on it is that's the ultimate source of it. But I, I thought his um, his novels where he painted barely concealed in very negative pictures of his family life was t um, very unfortunate. Uh, and so different from what you know, many of us, many of us who were at Libri and who became Christians there or who, or who were brought through a crisis of faith through being at Libri, um, you know, we have so much to be thankful for. Um, it, ha it happens. It happened in my family. My, gra my grandfather was a great Bible teacher. He started four Bible schools, LBI in Seattle. Some of you may know these. One in um, Minneapolis, one in L.A., one in Hawaii. He, he was a great Bible teacher. All of his kids walked away from the faith. Five kids. They became either nominal Christians at best, you know, or not at all. And most of them came back to the faith if they did because of the next generation, you know, my generation. <laughs> You know, the influence back on their parents. It's, it, it is a problem that Christian leaders face all the time. Well, let's put it this way. Christian worldview isn't just about preaching and teaching the Christian worldview. Christian worldview is about living it. And if you aren't living it in the deep fiber of your personal life, your kids know it. They're the ones who know it more than anybody. And I think that's one of them. As Christian worldview becomes sort of a buzzword now, <laughs> sort of popular, um, it's easy for people to treat it as just an intellectual tool or a way to win arguments, you know, or a new strategy for evangelism, and they forget that it starts here. You know, it starts in personal transformation. It starts with letting God's truth transform you from the inside out. And if you're out there preaching the word and you're not living it, you know, it's empty, it's hollow, and you, your, kids are the ones, your kids are the ones who show the result of it. I'm not saying Schaefer did, but it's a good reminder that psychological factors can drive kids to, which is kind of what you were getting at, maybe. As Christians, we have a bit of a conundrum because on one level, we're accused of exclusivity, that Jesus is the way, the side, and Jesus, that's it. On the other hand, we're all encompassing that the invitation is open to many. In your experience, what is the best way to address that charge and argument from those who do not understand it from an apologetics point of view? Yeah, I was just reading, I think it was Thomas Nagle. Nagle, Nagle. Do you know him? He's a uh, contemporary philosopher, um, not a Christian, definitely not a Christian, but he actually addressed this question as a non-Christian. He said, people say Christians are exclusive. He said, any claim to truth is exclusive. You know, if this is true, this is false. 
And he said, this, that's a ridiculous claim. That's a ridiculous charge, rather. He said, because any truth claim is exclusive. And I think that's probably the best answer. <laughs> You know, that the other person, whatever his truth claim, is just as exclusive as I am. Anyone who makes a truth claim is saying whatever, you know, if you say A, then non-A is false. If A is false, any non-A is false, is whatever. <laughs> if A is true, non-A is false. It's just in the nature of making a truth claim. And if you make a serious truth, now the person who, if the person responds, well, you know, what works for you, you know, it can be true for you, but not true for me, then you, then you say, okay, now we've gone into the question of postmodernism. <laughs> yeah. But as long as you're not in postmodernism, anyone, I mean, uh, th th and then you would have a different argument, maybe. You'd, you'd show them why postmodernism doesn't work. But in terms of just, it's just logic. You know, if, you, if, if um, the liberal, you know, the secularist, the Marxist, the feminist, whoever is, they're all making truth claims. They're all just as exclusive because that's what it means to make a truth claim. The reason people don't accept it of, of Christians is because, of course, Christianity has been put in the upper story, which it's not a matter of true or false, and therefore you're making a category mistake when you, make, when you say Christianity is true. If you were to stay, if you were to state your position on some, uh, say you were, you were to give your position on, on um, some issue, any issue of the day, and, and the other person said to you, "Well, that's just science. That's just facts. Don't impose it on me." Well, nobody says that, but they do say, "Oh, that's just your religion or your morality. Don't impose it on me." You see why? The, why the difference? Well, because religion and morality are purely private, personal, you know, non-cognitive. Upper story, you know, in the fact value split, they're in the value section. So if you start making truth claims when you're over here in the value department, you know, you, you, you're making a category mistake. <laughs> that's your problem. <laughs> and that's what's behind the, the charge of exclusivism. No, no, when you're talking about religion and morality there, we're talking about something that can't... Uh, uh, Julie Rubin, in the book I mentioned a moment ago, she said, when, when, you've, when you've got... When, when you've, um, facts got separated from values and religion and morality were put in the value domain, she said it did not even matter whether the doctrine was true or false. Because it's not about true or false. It's about inspiration. It's about ritual. It's about social cohesion. It's about personal meaning. It's about cultural tradition. It's all these other things. But it's not about true or false. You know, religion is not important for what it tells us. It's important for how it inspires us. And so once people are in that mindset, for you to make a truth claim is very jarring. You know, it violates their understanding of what religion and morality are all about. And so sometimes it may be helpful then to stand back and help them to realize that they have unconsciously absorbed this definition of what religion and morality are before you can even make a truth claim um, but the whole idea that you're imposing it, uh, uh, like, I, you know, I, I prefer chocolate, you prefer vanilla. If you try to persuade me I should like, uh, you know, your taste, that is imposing. I don't need to like what you like. Go away, you know. That's, that's people's reaction. Well, yes, if it's purely private, then it does feel like imposing. That's where that language of imposing comes from. It's because they're working with the value notion, you know, fact-value split. And so we've, then it's good to step back and say, look how you've absorbed this fact-value split. Then we'll talk about you know, why we can make genuine truth claims even in religion.